Woof woof and namaste. This is Hill Dog and welcome to Kana Cast, a series of conversations with visitors and residents of Kana Shantivanam, the International Center for Heartfulness near Hyderabad in Telangana, India. Today I am sitting down with Brian Jones. Brian is an artist and he's also a heartfulness meditation trainer. He also hosts wonderful heartfulness sessions online which are available on the Heartfulness Community YouTube channel. Brian also writes extensively on Quora and helps people out with their questions. His art can be found at brianjonesart.com. Brian is also a musician and someone who has done a lot of audio and video work as well. For those of you who don't know, heartfulness is a meditation technique that is offered for free by volunteer trainers around the world. It was earlier known by the name Sahaj Marg or the natural path. One of the specialities of heartfulness is meditation with the transmission of a very subtle energy. Since there will be a lot of reference to heartfulness in this talk, let me just fill you in on the heartfulness guides. The first guide was Lala Ji. Then there was Babuji from 1983 to 2014. Chariji was the heartfulness guide. And uh, from 2014 to the present day, Daji has been the heartfulness guide. You will also hear the word master during this talk. Master refers to both the heartfulness guide as well as the inner master or the higher self that is within us and all around us. Practitioners of heartfulness meditation or Sahaj Marg are called abhyasis. And a heartfulness meditation session is called a sitting. Brad, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for taking time out and uh, sitting down in the Kana studio. Absolutely. Thank you, Rudy. It's been great to catch up with you again. It's such a joy to meet you. And uh, we've been listening to you on uh, on the live telecast, which are called mm-hmm. Joy in Real Time. Yes, yes. And it's even more of a joy to meet you in uh, person. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. Very sweet. So, Brian, I'd, uh, I know you as uh, through heartfulness. Right. We, we, that's what brings us together. We both practice the heartfulness uh, way of meditation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also know that you're into art and you're into music. But I don't know much about you professionally and uh, you, what you do professionally and what you did professionally in your life. So, could you introduce us to what you did? Yeah. So... Well, that's a big question because I've done so many things <laughs> in my life. And uh, and that's been a wonderful experience. I've had a lot of different professions. So, yes, early on when I was 14, I started playing guitar. And uh, eventually, uh, well, I got really into that. I mean, I was very passionate about playing. And eventually I started a band and uh, where was this where this did was, you grow up right oh okay, yeah let's back up so <laughs> <laughs> so i grew up in cleveland ohio cleveland ohio in the usa and of course cleveland is the home of the rock and roll hall of fame you know so uh it's a uh, so you had to play guitar i had to play guitar there was no option everyone there is born with a guitar <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my father got me guitar because I expressed an interest in it. And I was practicing oh, six, eight hours every day. I just was loving it. And you know, eventually I started a band, started my first band. And uh, we were doing jazz fusion back in the 70s. And then in the 80s, I started a real progressive rock band. And we did all original music. And we had quite a following. We were probably could have broke out of Cleveland into a national marketplace, you know, but... Um, I sort of realized that this was probably not a great idea as far as a profession, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when we would play out as a band, if you walked away with $15 at the end of the night in your pocket, it was like a successful night, you know? So it wasn't a, a real way to make a living. Uh, but uh, anyway, after that, I got into the music industry as a sales rep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got hired by a sales rep firm. And what that meant was... We worked for about 12 to 15 different manufacturers of professional recording and audio equipment. So that was my next big career. And, you know, being a musician and playing guitar, all of that really helped. But what I really learned was sales and marketing. And so I was in that business for about 14 years and I started out working part time. 
a few years in, I had opened up a lot of accounts. I really put my heart and soul into it, and I was made a partner in the company. And a couple of years later after that, I owned the company. Oh, wow. So it was an interesting progression. Yeah, so that was a, a great learning experience because I, I love sales and marketing. And that sort of set me up for my next career because when the music industry changed, uh, which happened because a lot of big corporations came in and just took over the, the business end of it, uh, I found myself having to look reinvent what I was doing. I had to reinvent mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't easy. So there was a couple of years of you know, hardship, not knowing where, where I should go, what I should do. But one day I said to my daughter, I said, you know, I think I want to try painting. I said, take me up to Hobby Lobby and get me some paints and some canvases. And so we got a couple of canvases, we got some paints and I went home and I tried painting my first painting. And, 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 and Rudy, it was horrible. It was <laughs> so bad. <laughs> How old were you then when your first painting? I was in my 40s, 45, I think. I was in 1999. So I was, you know, starting late in life. And so I put it all away and I said, oh, this is way too hard, you know. But it, probably about a month later, I was a little bored. I thought, I've got one more canvas left. Let me try it again. I took out the paints and I did another canvas and it was not bad. And I sort of caught the bug, just like I did with guitar. And I started painting more and more and more. And pretty soon I'm painting a painting every day. And within a couple of years, I realized, I, I looked at the art industry from a business perspective because I had all this marketing and sales background. And I thought, oh, wow, this is a land of opportunity because I don't have to be the best artist. I just have to be the best marketer. <laughs> and so that was... That took me into the field of art, and I was getting shows and solo shows and reputable galleries, and things were taking off, and eventually I moved back to our hometown of Cleveland, and uh, I opened a gallery there. Gallery was very successful. We were voted best gallery oh, four wow. years in a row. Uh, sold paintings all over the country, all over the world, and so that was another era of my life, which was, yeah. A surprise, actually. It was a surprise. Yeah. So you start out in music in pretty much the golden era of rock and roll. It's like mm -hmm. when all the big rock bands were. That's right. It was all about the music at one time. Right. And then the business part of it took over. And that, that, mm -hmm. that is the time you kind of walked away. That's right. Yeah. So was it, was, what was that time like? It, w it must have been very uncertain at that time because what's going to happen in the future and uh, w where, where is your journey going to take you? How did you handle the uncertainty of it? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because when we look at technology and how, te how fast technology is advancing, uh, what happened to me back then was a perfect example of it because I was in a situation where uh, we were selling uh, recording equipment where you buy a big recording console that might cost, you know, twenty, twenty-five thousand, fifty thousand dollars. You might spend two thousand dollars on a microphone, and it was right at the time when digital audio was coming out and MIDI technology. And you know, within just a few years, suddenly, you could spend a thousand dollars and you could have a little box on your table and you could record at home and sound just like you were in a big recording studio. And so everything got smaller and cheaper and therefore less profit to be made, <laughs> you know, from a business perspective. And so, uh, so it was tied to the technology as well. And so I, I got to the point where uh, one day one of my biggest manufacturers uh, called me and said, um, meet me at the airport. I got to have a meeting with you, you know, and that was, that meeting was, well, you did a great job for the past 10 years. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it, but we're not going to renew your contract because now uh, the whole industry, we're just going to deal with the big corporations and we're, you know, work with the corporate offices. And, and I was basically put out of business in one day. Oh, my. <laughs> and I went back, and the next day I let everybody in my company go, except for one person. And that I was facing the unknown because, uh, you know, all our income was gone. Uh, everything I knew was now, didn't know where I was going to go. And so there was a time of 
two years of, of real uncertainty. And not only that, but my whole body was going through a shift. I was actually coming down, I think, off of the sales and marketing part. Mm -hmm. You know, just my whole body was starting to go through a transition and relax. And I then realized how tense I was from the sales and marketing side. And of course, the meditation helped all through this, you know, but it was a life crisis. And that's when, you know, again, I got into the art and <laughs> I never thought I would ever be an artist, to be honest with you. But it was another opening, another doorway, you know, to another side of life. Wow. So uh, sales and marketing, when you say sales and marketing, did, you, did this really involve interface with the artists or were you doing sales and marketing for musical equipment? Right. I was doing sales and marketing for musical equipment. Okay. Right. So I was dealing with um, music stores, mm -hmm. broadcast accounts, um, sound contractors, anything to do with sound and audio. And I worked for some huge companies such as, you know, Sennheiser. You've heard the sure. name. They're sure. very big. Tascam was another big name. Uh, yeah, many. <laughs> So growing up, who was your biggest influence in terms of music? I mean, in terms of when you took up guitar playing, what was the kind of music you were playing? Right. Well, loved bands like Yes, loved sure. bands like Journey, uh, loved guitarists like Jimi Hendrix, um, Eric Clapton, loved uh, Jimmy Page. You know, these were the, the rock legends of their day, you know, and of course... Those were influences, but, you know, to be honest with you, we had a local guy who Jimi Hendrix had said was the world's greatest guitarist. Wow. And he was from the Cleveland area. His name is Phil Kagey, and he got heavily into uh, Christian rock, but he's a, a legendary guitar player that not that many people heard of, and he was a huge influence on me. So is his uh, stuff available online? Can people Absolutely. check him out? Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely in the, in the Christian genre. But amazing, amazing acoustic guitar player, electric guitar player. Incredible. And is any of your band's uh, stuff available online to do? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be nice to. I mean, unfortunately, the digital world wasn't uh, there. The internet wasn't there. Otherwise, there would have been a digital footprint. Today, anything you do... We, it leaves a digital footprint, I mean. <laughs> right, right. Well, we, we, we left an analog footprint. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing you uploaded to YouTube? Are those, are those kept in a vault somewhere? Those? They, yeah, a vault in my, in my basement in a, in a box someplace. <laughs> <laughs> it's as closely guarded as the Coca-Cola recipe. Yeah, though, though I did come, yes, though I, I did come a, across an old video of me playing a solo guitar back then, a piece I had written. I posted it up on Facebook recently. So, oh, nice. Uh, that was nice to revisit, you know. Nice. And the other constant in your life has, of course, been meditation. Right. How did that start? Was there something growing up that you were interested in religion, spirituality? In, do you find something in your childhood that may have influenced that? You know, my father was Catholic. My mother was Protestant. So at an early age, probably around four years old, you know, they would dress me all up in a nice little suit and a nice little hat. And they would take me, my father would take me to Catholic church, which was this big, old, huge stone church in cleveland very frightening looking <laughs> <laughs> and had big wooden doors and you'd walk in and you could hear the echo and you had the stained glass windows and the big altar with its golden chalices and everything it was a it was a little daunting you know <laughs> and uh, i just innately knew this was not for me and so at at age four i used to beat my hands and feet on the floor every Sunday saying, I'm not going, I'm not going. <laughs> and I like to say, I left the Catholic church by age five. So, <laughs> so that wasn't it. But uh, <clears throat> I did have an inner longing for something. And eventually we got, well, this is sort of interesting. In the Cleveland area, uh, the American Indian movement mm -hmm. got its start. And they used to have their what were called powwows uh, right up the street from where we lived. And we went up there, my father got to know them, and we would go every Sunday to their 
powwows, their meetings, and we got to learn some of the dances of the American Indians and got involved in that. And that was really exciting and interesting for me. So I was really young at the time. I was probably maybe only eight, nine years old. So that was quite an influence. But where it really shifted for me is my father started me taking Aikido, which is a form of martial art. And the teacher was the first person to bring it out of Japan. And I was 14 years old, I know maybe 12 years old. And what happened was um, it, Aikido was all about using the mind. So you would flow this key energy through your body and you can do amazing things with it. One of the things I used to do is I, you would flow the key energy through your body, down through your legs and into the earth. Nobody could lift you off the ground. So they would even have three big guys trying to lift me off the ground. I weighed about 90 pounds, could not do it. So at that age, that was interesting. I thought, wow, there's something more. There's something I don't understand here. And so that got me into the mind, psychic sciences. The teacher of Aikido taught us meditation, got into that. I started getting books on Zen and Buddhism and Taoism and Christian mysticism. And I started diving in, and that was the beginning of my real spiritual quest. And what was the response of people around you? I mean, you were interested in uh, these different things, and your father's a Catholic, and uh, your mother's also Protestant. Was she was she also devout? Would would she go to church often? No. She did take me to church for a while after mm -hmm. I left the Catholic Church. I, I migrated over. This to, one's better. I migrated over to the Protestant for a while, <laughs> and that was kind of fun because we had a, a Sunday school, and there were other friends there, and we got to go up and play the organ, and it was it was more fun, you know. But that didn't last long either. But no, my parents were very open. So they let me explore any sort of spirituality that I wanted wow. to. And about your peer group, your friends and things like that, was this just the time when everybody was exploring or were you kind of on your own out there? Uh, I'd say at the early age, I really wasn't sharing my search with others, mm -hmm. with friends. We was more playtime. But when I got into junior high and high school, then I found a lot of like-minded people and we were all on a spiritual search. And we even studied together many different modalities and even took a yoga class together back in 1974 when it was barely known in, yes, in yes. the United States. Yes. And now, of course, there's yoga studios on every street corner. Every street corner. But um, what do you think was it was about that time that this entire generation, your entire generation was looking for something? I mean, uh, there was mm -hmm. this search. Right. You know, uh, something did happen, and it started in the 60s. And, you know, it was like people <laughs> en masse got tired of the status quo and the idea of the American dream and everything that that represented. And somehow or other, that just seemed to percolate up out of nowhere and a whole generation was born of people who were looking for something more, something different. They didn't want the status quo. And so that gave birth to what we know as the, the hippie era and the, you know, yes, the yes, 60s yes. and the 70s. And I was sort of on the tail end of that, but I was definitely a part of it. And I think that was an amazing time. You know, and even with the band and the music and the bands and the, the Beatles, for example, and the Maharishi and, you know, uh, it opened people's minds and hearts to being free, you know, thinking freely, dressing freely. I remember, you know, when I first approached my father about growing my hair long <laughs> and, you know, he was open-minded, but not really f for me doing that. And it was my barber who actually said to my father, you know, the style now, they're letting it grow a little longer. It would probably be okay, you know? And so my father said, oh, okay, okay, you can grow it. So, you know, eventually I had hair growing all the way down my back. <laughs> it was real, real, very wavy, you know, you know, down to here in high school. And I used wow. to wear it back in a ponytail. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great times. And now that you look back on that time and you look back, I mean, because now, everything is put in a kind of a bracket, right? Everybody likes to put things in neat little boxes. Mm -hmm. So that generation is called the boomer generation, and uh, it's kind of 
I mean, it's kind of uh, strange to reduce all of that into this one word. Right. What is your own feeling about it? Was it something that started something that is still growing? Has it uh, has it uh, run its course, or do you think that is pretty much a part of something that is a, a living stream that change that was happening? Well, to answer that, I'd probably have to go back to the end of the 1800s, okay? Because it was during that period of time where, for the you know many who knows how long, many centuries and everything, uh, art was done in a very realistic way, a uh, very formal way. Music was done in a very classical style, very formal, you know, reading the music. And, but right at the end of the 1800s, something really big happened. And suddenly, almost overnight, artists are painting entirely differently. Uh, they're just a, sort of attacking the canvas with these, you know, uh, wild brushstrokes and, you know, the, throughout all the, everything to do with realism. And, you know, they wanted to just capture the essence of what they were seeing, the, the, the essence and the light. That was what they were interested in. And that was the birth of Impressionism. And in the field of music, we went from classical music to uh Dixieland jazz, which was, uh, you know, came about probably around the early 1900s. And here we have a situation where the musicians weren't even using sheet music. And every, all the musicians just were playing their own melodies all together at the same time. And it was this wild, cacophonous, uh, uh, crazy sound. And it was the birth of jazz music. And so when we look at that, and then on the heels of that, we're seeing all the, you know, scientific discoveries and discoveries in, in medicine and across the board. It was like, uh, almost like um, the obelisk from 2001 Space Odyssey, you mm -hmm. know, where the obelisk suddenly appears and it, asks, and it acts like a, a catalyst for evolution. And <laughs> yes. then... It's just everything takes off. There was some sort of catalyst at the end of the 1800s that uh, sparked a whole new direction of evolution. Now, I look at things like the 60s as a ripple of that. So I think that, you know, we're seeing several kinds of ripples. Of course, we saw the negative, too, because just as that created such a positive change in so many ways, it was the, you know, the other, the other wave, the uh, end of the wave form, you know, it's like, uh, you know, to have one, to have a sound in a single cycle wave, you have to have both sides. And so just as the wave was rising up, uh, with new eras of creativity and science, uh, then we went into the worst of humanity, and uh, you know we saw the, the the rise of ego and and greed and you know so many things that caused World War One, World War Two, so many wars. So we're still seeing the ripple effect of that too. So I think now we're seeing another ripple, and it's very much tied to technology, but it, it's also still, we're still having wars, you know, that's still going on too. But now it's starting to get at a higher, more refined level with, you know, um, with the way we approach uh, the influence of technology in our lives. So I find now, for example, with the gaming industry, which has become so prevalent and all of my grandkids, you know, they're big time gamers. They just love it. This is another wave because out of that gaming industry, now we're seeing the metaverse start to emerge, which is, and many people don't even realize what the metaverse is or is going to be, but within a few years, it's going to change the way we're doing many things in the world. Uh, everything is going to go much more virtual. Uh, our interaction online is going to become very different than the way we know it now. So anyway, to answer your question with a long answer, <laughs> sorry. No, but, but, but uh, was, yeah. I, I enjoyed that depiction of uh, 
not looking at anything in isolation, but looking at it as a continuum. Continuum, yeah, Yes, for sure. so it's not, I mean, because there is a tendency, oh, that was the boomer generation and it's like kind of over. But it's not. It's very much a part of yeah. we're, what we're, is happening right now. Yeah, there's, there's really uh, less and less of black and white and just mm. infinite shades of gray, I think, you know. Kind of like your beard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My beard uh, is happy. With the <laughs> it has never been compared to uh, life. and uh, <laughs> It's part of the continuum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Brad, I wanted to ask you the, the martial arts. You start with the martial arts and you, you have a little inroad into uh, mysticism in a way because there's a meditation practice. So mm -hmm. there's Eastern thought coming in through that Japanese martial art. That's right. How do you take it further? How does the young Brian take it further then? Okay, so I had a very profound experience when I was about 15 years old because I was doing my own practice of Zen where bringing I was bringing my mind to the oh, present. you already started doing some Zen. Yeah, 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 but just from books and things. This was after the Aikido era was over. I was continuing on my own, and I was just reading from books, and so I was kind of doing a what we now know as mindfulness, where I was, I would bring my mind to the present moment. And then I catch myself, bring my mind to the present moment, catch myself, bring my mind to the present moment. And I did that as a pretty intensive practice. And I had an enlightenment experience. Uh, one day I was riding my bike, make a long story short, I had almost like a Zen Cohen come up deep from within me. And it was something like, you don't get something from nothing. And I'm riding further and this deep vibration comes up. You don't get something from nothing. And it repeated maybe 20 times. And I remember riding, I got to the top of this small hill and it repeated one more time. And it was as though my mind inverted on itself and flipped inside out. And suddenly my mind completely dissipated. I had no mind. I had no thoughts. And literally, I knew everything. It was like a state of omniscience. And I was 15. And I, I knew, wow. And somehow I was, could perceive to myself, maybe this is that enlightenment experience that, that I was reading about. You know, but I didn't really know what to make of it. And I couldn't really talk to anybody about it because it was just so profound. But for the next week. I had no mind, no thought. Go wow. to bed, nothing. Wake up in the morning, zero. But after a week, thoughts started coming back to me and, you know, life started up again. But the problem was I became a horrible student. And the reason was that I now had experienced that all of us contain all knowledge within us. And so in school, having to revert back to the teacher pointing to the blackboard and, you know, read chapter five, it seemed like I was going into the dinosaur era and I just couldn't relate. And I became a horrible student. And I also got involved with partying and drinking and everything. I just, everything went downhill for me. And so it wasn't good for me to have such an enlightenment experience at that age, you know, especially without a guide or mm -hmm. someone I could talk with, you know. So anyway, um, I went through some hard times with that, went through the drinking partying phase, which lasted many years. And by the time I was 18, I was really in a place where I was down and out, desperate. And I found out about a woman named Grace who was... Uh, teaching a type of meditation and I thought oh, all right I'll check it out so I called her and went to visit her and she introduced me to what we now know as heartfulness wow and she was she was the first um, I think she was the first preceptor or trainer in North America and her and her daughter had spent a lot of time with one of the masters of heartfulness Babaji in India they would stay with him and so this is how I got into what I'm doing now and we had our first three meditations, of which I didn't feel anything except a lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go back for a year after that. 
but she had given me some a couple little books, Reality at Dawn and something else. And, and I kept looking at the pictures in the front of there's Babaji in meditation pose and his master, Lalaji. And, you know, it was the pictures that were very compelling to me to see those. And eventually, about a year later, I did go back and have a sitting with her where I did have a very profound spiritual experience. I just stood up after the sitting and I felt weightless and I was outside my body. I didn't know how I was even walking. And I relayed that to her and she sort of chuckled and said something about transmission. And, <laughs> and that convinced me that, oh, there's something to this. And that's how I got started. So wow. since I was, you know, that was 1974. So I've been doing it all this time. You know, it's almost 50 years now. So the first time around when you did the three sittings, uh, you didn't know about transmission. You weren't, uh, it was just a meditation. It was just a meditation. Right. But uh, once you went back and she told you about transmission, mm -hmm. now this is um, uh, something that is not easy to explain. How did you explain it to yourself? <laughs> Well, Rudy, I don't, I don't think I really, I don't think even to this day I can really understand it, to be honest with, to be fair. Okay. So I wasn't trying to wrap my head around it so much as I was just exploring it and, and in a state of wonder about it, you know, it was something I was experiencing and I was taking sittings from Grace then regularly and from her daughter who was also a preceptor and, and the experience I was having were incredible, you know? Um, and for me, I'm a science-minded person, so I have to have proof. Sure. I just, I'm not into believing things randomly. And so this was delivering the goods. And here I am sitting talking with you all this time later and uh, I'm more amazed than I've ever been. Wow. So uh, that uh, one experience in the sitting uh, then convinced you that there was something to it for sure. Right. So you kept uh, kept on with the practice. How did it get deeper? How did your involvement get deeper? It was just a gradual sort of... Uh, well, again, if I want to talk about that time period... Uh, Eventually, Grace and her daughter and her family moved to New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I was the only one left in like probably 10 states around uh, in, the, in the U.S., uh, because in those days, there were only about 33 people in the entire North America that wow. even knew about this. Wow. So, and there weren't cell phones, and there was no internet, so it was, you know, you want to communicate with someone, it, had to, it was either a long-distance call, or you had to put a letter in the mailbox and so I was pretty much on my own. And during that time, I was having a lot of profound experiences of transmission. And I'd go up to the mall. I was just a young guy. I'd go up to the mall and I'm just, you know, going to have a little lunch or something. And all of a sudden, it felt like, like Niagara Falls is pouring through me, you know. And I, I, what was I to make of that, you know? Uh, it was incredible. But I figured, you know, Babaji must have thought, well, He's the only one there. We got to use him. You know, he, probably not our best candidate, but you know, <laughs> let's go with it. <laughs> well, so uh, coming to Babuji, when uh, did uh, Grace introduce you to Babuji? He's the guide. You you saw the pictures, of course, in the books. But right. what was your reaction? Because um, well, the, the amazing thing was is the room we meditated in, which is a very small room with a bed on one side and a chair and a little dresser. Uh, Babaji had visited Cleveland two years before I started, and this was the room he stayed in. Oh, wow. And so there was a picture of him there, and you know she had mentioned, oh, yeah, Babaji, yes, he stayed here. And uh, So I knew about it, but I knew about Babaji, but I didn't really know much about Babaji. And it wasn't until maybe six years later in 1980 that uh, by that time I had met my wife-to-be, and we heard that Babaji was going to be coming to Europe, to Germany. And we were really poor at the time. We didn't have a lot of money, you know. And uh, we took all kinds of odd jobs that we could. I was painting houses. My wife was cleaning houses. We did whatever we could to scrape up the money to get a plane ticket to go to Germany and to meet Babaji for the very first time. So in 1980... That's exactly what we did. We went with a few friends of ours and uh, 
that first meeting with him was, wow. What was that like? Where did you meet him? So he was staying at someone's home. And, you know, to really tell the, tell the tale, which I should do, we were still kind of like pirates, you know? <laughs> we were still partying and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff we shouldn't be doing. And so when we, we got to Munich maybe five days early, three, four, five days early. And we were down at the Hofbrauhaus drinking the dark beers. And we were just out, you know, in Germany, they serve beer at McDonald's. You know, everybody <laughs> drinks beer for breakfast. It's everywhere. Sure. You know? So we weren't good abyasis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so finally he arrived. and we, You were very happy abyasis. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we were, well, that's one word we could use. <laughs> But uh, we, he arrived, and we, that one morning we walked to the house where he was staying, and someone said, uh, go around into the backyard. And we went to the backyard, and there were some glass doors looking into a room, and there was a room full of people. And someone motioned like this for us to you know, come in. So I opened the door, I stepped into the room, and immediately to my right, I mean right next to me, was Babaji. And he looked up at me like this, and our, um, his face was like this far from me. And his eyes were startling. I mean, they were like mirrors. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I was so taken aback. Oh, my gosh, this is Babaji. I couldn't even greet him. I couldn't even say anything. I was speechless. So we made our way into the room and sat in the back. And I sat with my back up against the wall. And Babaji hadn't said a word. He just sat there radiating this beautiful, divine essence. And he would just look around the room at people. And I'm sitting there looking at him, and all of a sudden, he, he just looks over at me like this. And Rudy, in seconds, I feel, do 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 Wow. All of the chakras, one after the other, were touched or affected or something happened. And wow. I knew he had seen my soul from the beginning and everything after that in my life had been changed. I just knew it. And that was my first exposure to, to, to Babaji. And then uh, finally someone got the courage to ask Babaji a question. And uh, it had to do with drinking, actually. The Germans asked about, Babaji, what about, what about alcohol? And Babaji said, for the first time, he said, alcohol is forbidden in our method. And the Germans got up in arms. Oh, but Babaji, <laughs> we drink beer for breakfast. And, you know, we have, it's part of our culture. And Babaji then said, culture has nothing to do with Sahaj Mark. And those were the first words I heard him say. And I felt so ashamed, you know, of our drunkenness a few days beforehand. And I mm. thought, oh, my gosh, I felt really bad. But I can only imagine that Babaji was, you know, probably looking up to Lalaji, his master, saying, saying, these are the people you're sending me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. How did life change after that meeting, and, and your um, wife was with you? Yeah, my wife was. We weren't married at the time. Okay. But when we bat, went back, um, life definitely changed. Did she, have a, did she have a similar experience? Did she? Yeah, she also. Was it momentous for her as well? It wasn't as momentous as it was for me. It was more momentous for her the second time we mm -hmm. got to see him. But uh you know, we made changes. Uh, we were meditating more regularly. We had a small group by that time put together. Uh, but, you know, we were still young and still doing crazy things too. So, uh, you know, I, w I wouldn't say that I was, you know, totally transformed at that point in my life, but I was, you know, started to be pushed in a new direction, which was necessary. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So after that, did you meet Babuji uh, many more times? Were you able to? So I only met him one other time, mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I. We went to see him in 1982 in Paris, France. And this was a gathering held at a university there that was in off-season. 
And so we were staying in the dorms and Babaji was also staying in one of the dormitories. But by this time, <clears throat> he was in frail. He was, he was frail and in ill health mm -hmm. and he needed help walking. And he didn't come out the first few days. Um, it was just a, it was just a kind of an odd situation, you know, but it was very international, the gathering, but you know, th there was a tension in the air, mm. you know, uh, I think there was no sense of family or community at that time because things were so new. And this was one of the first times internationally that people were coming from the States and mm -hmm. Europe and some from India and we were all getting together and, you know, no one was, was coming together and coalescing like a group. Everybody sort of stayed in their own. Not forthcoming at all. Right. Uh, yeah. But, but an amazing thing happened. And this relates to music. One day at lunchtime, we're out in the grassy area and someone from Ireland pulls out a little flute and starts playing. And everyone's like, Oh, wow. That's, they start to gather around, you know, and, and someone grabs a, finds a guitar or something and starts playing guitar and, oh, wow, you know, it was really great. You know, this is exciting. And so somehow it was agreed that let's have a musical concert with whoever wants to perform. So we arranged for two nights later at the auditorium, everybody just come down spontaneously. And we all gathered there in the auditorium. Now, up until this time, Babaji hadn't even come out. Okay. So that night we gather in the auditorium and it was the most incredible experience. People were getting up and playing guitar or singing in different languages and performing together. And one woman got up and was just using her voice as an instrument. And one guy got up with his guitar and he's playing some, he was from France and he was playing some blues song and singing in French and somebody got up with the harmonica and was playing and people just joined in and it was this beautiful musical experience and it just created such a sense of camaraderie and the next day everybody's smiling and you know greeting each other and that day Babaji came out wow you know I think he felt like oh wow the family's <laughs> emerging you know it was nice it was great Nice. It's, I, I'm, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we don't have tape recordings or somebody must have recorded that evening. Uh, do you, I don't, I don't know. No. Oh. But I have an, well, exp I, being a musician, I have an expression is that the best jams never get recorded. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know. Yeah. Sure. That's what makes them so good. <laughs> Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you, you, uh, as you said, a scientific mindset and growing up in Cleveland and um, also, uh, you know, going to church and uh, the idea of having a guru isn't easily accepted, um, you know, especially in the Western world, even today. And back then, I guess it was pretty much the same. Yes. So how did you make your personal sort of uh, peace with the idea that I have this person, or was he just like um, a teacher in the beginning and it changed over time? Yeah, I would say he was just a, I, well, I would say probably he was a teacher. I didn't really know, I think I didn't know how to process Babaji, to be honest, to be fair. It was just something, I was on a ride and something was going on. I have no idea what's going on, but it seems to be coming from this fellow. So I'm going to stick with that. And, <laughs> and that eventually, I think that just like any relationship starts when you first meet someone and, you know, it's hi, hello, shake their hand. And then after you get to know them a little bit, you hear about their family and you start to warm up to them and you start to have a friendship. And then, you know, once you really get to know them, you have experiences together, it starts to become more profound and Eventually, you know, especially between a man and a woman, you have, might, might have a, a marriage happen. Um, and I think that uh, it was sort of like that. Uh, I don't know when there was or if there was a day that I fell in love with Babaji. And it's just love started to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once, once you are in love with Babaji, it must be very difficult to handle his passing. 
1983. Oh. How did you handle that? Oh. So, this is a great question. So I'm, I'm ashamed to say that even by that time, I was still partying somewhat and drinking somewhat, going out with friends and doing all of that. And I remember, you know, I was out with friends drinking and the next morning I got up, felt feeling terrible and the phone rings and it's one of the Abyasis telling, uh, telling me Babaji passed away. And I was just absolutely, I was in shock actually. And shamefully again, my first thought was, oh my gosh, I've, I, I, have I lost you? Have I lost you, Babaji? And so I immediately went to my sofa and I sat down and closed my eyes to see if the connection was still there. And very quickly, I felt Babaji's presence, just as I always had, and just su such tears of gratitude, you know, came and uh, I just was, you know, so so thankful that in, in spite of myself, uh, that that I knew Babaji wouldn't give up on me, you know. Yeah. And of course, after that time, uh, we had Chariji. Of course, there were a lot of shenanigans about the succession. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of controversy. Had you met Chariji during uh, the time you met Babuji? Were you, did you already know him? So, when we were in Germany, he was there. He was traveling with Babuji, and he was a larger than life figure. He was a bit standoffish. <laughs> uh, he was not a warm, cozy person. <laughs> I certainly couldn't warm up to him, but I did, uh, I did summon the courage, uh, to ask him for an individual sitting. And, and at first I, you know, foolishly, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to, I think I'm going to ask Babaji for a sitting, you know, of course, <laughs> then I quickly realized, oh no, that's probably not appropriate. So I thought, oh God, I'll go with the second guy. Okay. You know, <laughs> So I asked him for a sitting, and he gave me an individual sitting at the time. But, you know, we didn't really develop any sort of rapport. Mm -hmm. And when I saw him again in uh, 1982 in Paris, uh, once again, I talked to him briefly. I had another sitting with him in a room with a few other people. But, again, no, no relationship. I didn't really know him. Mm -hmm. But when Babaji passed in... And then in 1985, he came to the United States for the first time with his wife as the successor. And I, I accepted the fact that, okay, he, he's the successor, but I hadn't accepted that he's a, my master. Because, you know, you, when you love someone, you don't just, oh, here's the new person. Oh, yes. Oh, I love you. I love you. <laughs> I, I mean, it's nothing like that, you know? So... Uh, he stayed in Cleveland with, uh, at a friend's house and there was about only 15 of us at the time. And we had the most amazing time with him because we hung out with him every day and we'd walk up to the pizza store and get pizza or we'd go to the candy shop and get candy. And, and at that time it was funny, we were both wearing the same Reebok tennis shoes. So it stuck in his mind that I was also wearing the same shoes. So he started giving me a nickname, Reebok man. So whenever he'd see me, Reebok man, you know, and that, that, that stuck with me as my nickname from him for like years after that, you know, he would see me and he would just, Reebok man. <laughs> it was so, it was nice. It was sweet. So this was a way that we began to get to know him. We had a lot of sittings with him, but to be honest, Rudy, I still hadn't accepted him in my heart and I mm -hmm. knew it. And by the following year, it started to occur to me, you know, if I don't resolve this, that my progress may stop or I might stagnate. I knew it. And I think it was a year later that he had come, came back to the United States and we had a gathering in, uh, at a Boy Scout camp down in Atlanta. 
very rustic setting with a tent. There was maybe 150 of us. And so I knew I have to confront Chari G. I have to confront him and I have to tell him the truth, which is I'm afraid of him. So I, we were down there and I set an appointment to meet up with him. And a couple of days later, someone said, oh, Chari, we'll meet you now. And he was in the back of the cabin and sitting at this old desk. And I, I knelt down next to the desk facing him as he's working, he's working on something. And he, and he kind of looks up at me, he says, he says, okay, so uh, what can I do for you? And I just kind of blurted out, I just need to tell you that, you know, I'm afraid of you. And he chuckled this little laugh and he said the most wonderful thing. He said, oh, I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. <laughs> and, and there was kind of a, a melting, you know, uh, in that moment. And he just, uh, we talked just a couple of other things very, very briefly. And he said to me, he said, why don't you sit down front tomorrow morning for the morning meditation? And I said, yes, I'll do it. So next morning came, I sat down front and uh, Chari G came to the tent or the room wherever we were having it. And he sat down and as soon as he said, please begin meditation. I felt like the ceiling sky above me completely opened up and I felt all the love of the entire universe pouring onto me, pouring onto me so much that I thought my heart was literally going to explode. It was like, again, a Niagara Falls experience. It was just, just immense love. And that's when I knew, oh, this is my master. You are my master. That was the moment. Wow. Wow. And then, of course, your, uh, your engagement must have changed with Chariji. How did life change with Chariji after that? Yeah, it, it changed a lot because now I felt he was accessible. You know, I, I realized him as the inner master. Uh, I realized that, you know, he bought, was embodying Babaji, that uh, Babaji didn't really disappear or anything. He just was now, that divinity was residing in a, in a new form. And I think the plus for that from the spiritual perspective was that I realized, well, you know, if this divinity can exist in such very different type types of people, so different, then I have to accept that the divinity is resides in myself, you know, in the same way. And so that for me was a big breakthrough on the path. And then you, of course, met Chariji many, many more times. You started year after year after year. Wow. Traveled with him all over India. We traveled all over Europe, all over the United States. Yeah. So starting 1985 when he came to um, the States and then uh, all the way up to 2014. That's right. What was that period like uh, seeing what uh, was going on in Sahaj Marg and heartfulness, how the movement was growing? What was it like for you? Well, <clears throat> you know, in those days, there were, in the United States, let me talk about the United States, okay, there was a real sense of family. The mission was very small, so everybody knew each other, and we couldn't wait to get together, <laughs> you know, and especially if Chariji was coming, you know, we'd have these small gatherings, and it was just beautiful, so beautiful. Uh, and even when we traveled in the early days of Europe and everything, everybody knew each other. And it was, yeah, it was something very special. But then, you know, the mission, of course, started growing, started getting bigger. And in the days of Babaji, you know, when Babaji was available, people would come running down the hall saying, Babaji's out, come, come now, come now, you know, and they'd be shoving you into the room. But the mission got so big that when Chariji had so many followers 
Then it was the opposite. People were shoving you out of out the room. Of the room. <clears throat> that was a little. That was a little more uh, difficult to uh, to take. But you know, there was nothing that really could be done about it. Uh, you know, it's hard to deal with that sort of growth, exponential growth, especially when you're talking about something so intimate as a spiritual guide, a spiritual master, someone you need to interface with, you you need to connect with them on the human level. You know, it's essential. And I think I saw that progression all the way up to the point where it became less and less possible for many people to really ever interface with him in the way that I got to. So I feel very blessed and fortunate in that way. Mm. I don't know if it was Chariji or someone, because I remember reading somewhere where uh, I think Chariji said it, that uh, there will come a time when you will need binoculars to look at the master, <laughs> yeah. know, because it'll be so far away. There'll be such a crowd of people. Yeah. We're almost there. <laughs> We're almost there, pretty much. We have giant LED screens. Thank exactly. you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we don't all have to buy binoculars. <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> Um, so, you must have, of course, while this was going on, this expansion was going on, you must have come across a certain gentleman called Kamlesh Patel, since yes. he was in the States. Mm -hmm. When did you first meet uh, Kamlesh Bhai, as he was known then? I think I met him early on, um, sometime in the 80s. I'm sure that I might have met him, or at least in 1990, 91. And he was... He wasn't an, a person who was very obvious. Sure. You know, he was very introspective. And even when the gatherings got bigger, you know, you might see him once or twice. Maybe you would know he was there. But most of the time, you know, he was there laying on his on his bunk. And I think probably there were plenty of people saying, oh, that Kamala, she doesn't do anything. He just, just lays there in his bed all day long. You know, <laughs> little did we know that he, he was the one focusing on the spiritual work and, and the connection and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, understated would, is what a word that would come to mind For when sure. you think of uh, uh, Kamlesh Bhai with, uh, because we all remember gatherings with Chariji and we, you don't really, you know, notice Kamlesh by much because he's quiet and he's just, but he's there. You know that right. he's there. So when um, uh, Chariji finally announced that uh, Kamlesh Bai is going to be the guide after him, what was your reaction like? Were you surprised or were you, did, you ex did you kind of expect it? I wasn't surprised. I, <clears throat> I mean, I knew him. And even when I used to go to trade shows in New York City, uh, I would stop by his house and we would exchange sittings and we would have tea and we would talk. So by this time, I did know him personally and I knew how intensely <laughs> devoted he was. And I knew from the sittings that I had had, you know, with him that he was a very deep spiritual person. So it didn't surprise me. And I think I wrote a, a letter immediately saying, you know, I wholeheartedly accept you as the spiritual guide. Well, well. and how has your relationship with him been after, um, you know, 2014 onwards, you've been meeting him? And of course, as you said, the personalities are very different. Just like Babuji was very different from Chariji, Chariji was very different from Daji. Mm -hmm. And um, w w what is your uh, interaction with uh, Daji been like? Right. So there hasn't been all that much, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, um, on a personal level. I mean, the times that I've spoken to him one on one, I could count on one hand. You know, uh, the times. Last evening being one of those. <laughs> well, we didn't speak one on one. We were there with dinner with a. Oh, it was a large group, group of people, okay. and you know, so I'm I'm hoping to have some one on one time with him while I'm here. I'm, I'm hoping for that. Yes, I hope this gets out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should release it immediately. <laughs> immediately, <laughs> at least that portion. Um, so, uh, but uh, you know, he knows me. You know, he always welcomes me, and uh, I don't feel. I'm at a different point in my spiritual journey now. I don't feel a need to have to be around him. 
I don't feel a, a strong need to always have to connect with him. Um, I feel also from his end uh, that he trusts me and he's pretty much told me that in different ways. And so he knows that, you know, whatever I need to be doing and thinking about in terms of the work and uh, the, the way it manifests through my persona, uh, that he trusts that. So mm -hmm. I think that's great. And I think that that's the thing that needs to happen because, you know, just, I remember Chari G used to do this, he used to do this thing when there were small groups around him and he did this for a few years. He would ask this question and this is very profound. He would look at everybody and would say, is master in your heart or is master your heart? Is master in your heart? Or is master your heart? Oh, people would get very, you know, like this. You know, they weren't sure how to answer. And more than half the time, people would say, oh, master, you're in my heart. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the answer he wanted is that master is your heart. And if we think that master is in our heart, we're always creating a sense of separation between that presence in our heart so true. and the divine being that we are, the divine self we are, because the culmination of the spiritual journey is that grand realization that, yes, we are all that. And that has to happen. So, um, so I think for me now, um, I'm at peace with that. Beautiful, beautiful. That's so inf insightful, that question from Charity. Mm -hmm. So as the mission has grown, there's people, there's a lot more people, and everybody has their, their own different character, as we were discussing with uh, the three guides that you've been associated with. Different uh, characters, different uh, set of likes and dislikes, different tastes. That's a difficulty people face in the real world too, that there are a lot of people may have different tastes to us, you know? And yet, it's one big family. It's a gigantic family. How do you think, uh, how do you handle the differences amongst this large number of people? Because when anywhere where you have a large number of people, you will have lots of differences, mm -hmm. differences of opinion, differences of uh, thought, differences of priorities. How, how do you handle that? Well, I don't know if I'm handling anything. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more that, you know, I sort of enjoy the differences and I enjoy hearing the different uh, perspectives from people and what they feel heartfulness means to them and what it is. It, also because it changes over, uh, in one person, a person changes his opinion so many times. The yes. journey is like that. I mean, absolutely, the opinions I held 20 years ago would be so different from what I hold now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And same for, same for me. So I'm very, I'm probably, you know, more open than I've ever been uh, to, you know, what heartfulness really is. You know, I don't, I don't believe that heartfulness is, you know, per se, you know, just an organization or a name that represents something or a, a, a spiritual group or even a spiritual movement. And I know we, <clears throat> you know, we're all of these things in a way. But uh, to me, heartfulness is the laugh of a small child. Um, somebody in need where your heart goes out to them. Um, it, it, it's more like that for me. It's become very human and maybe just more sensitized to the humanity that we are. That to me has become what heartfulness means to me. Beautiful. Also, you've been, you've been doing uh, so many Quora you're on Cora, you answer questions on Cora, and you've been doing live sessions where you introduce people to heartfulness. Mm -hmm. You're a trainer, you train people, and you're helping people with that. 
So in that, you must be getting a lot of questions because people aren't really, you know, they've grown to mistrust uh, organizations, large organizations, um, and especially anything to do with religion and spirituality. There is a growing mistrust amongst the younger people, especially. And uh, the first, the first uh, sort of um, reaction is, oh, is it a cult? Is uh, are they going to be passing out the Kool Aid sometimes? So wait a minute, what is this that I've been thinking? <laughs> I, it's not Kool Aid, right? Oh, no, I, I feel pretty good so far, so we're good. <laughs> Shrikant, we have to put the Kool Aid. <laughs> well, Get forgot, rid of this one. Forgot the Kool Aid. <laughs> Why is this not a cult? Because I know what the divinity within me feels like. I know. Um, that I experience that sense of connection. I experience it with others. I don't have to give it a name. Heartfulness could be called whatever. It could be called something different. And as I say, you know, the old saying, uh, you know, uh, a rose by any other name is still a rose. So the name and the form, all of that is not something I really focus on. When people come to me, Generally, I find they're coming to me because they feel like, whether it's through my answers or however they got to know me on Quora, they feel like I'm someone who was approachable for them. And when they come to me, they usually want to be heard, one. Um, they feel like there's some level of trust there, that they can trust me. And I want to hear them out. And uh, many times I spend a lot of sometimes years interacting with people and we never meditate together because that's not it for me. That's not the end game. I'm not trying to um, sell anyone on meditation. I'm just here to listen. And if they are hurting, if I can be a sounding board for them, if I can give them any tips or guidance, then, uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And eventually, if they want to meditate, I let it come from their side. Wow. And um, reflecting back on these years, these, these many years that you've been associated with Heartfulness, right from those first three sittings in Cleveland, mm -hmm. in Babuji's room, <laughs> yeah. the one he stayed in, yes, and uh, where you didn't feel anything, but you you got the books and it was... But then you got associated. And if you look back at the Brian before those three sittings and Brian today, what do you think has been the one, not the one, what, what do you think has been, the, has been the major change? I think I know less and less who Brian is. And uh, happily so. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's lovely. <laughs> It's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you so much, Brian, for sitting down with us. It was it was such a lovely conversation. We could carry on. It's about it's been an hour. Oh but wow! <laughs> <laughs> we could carry on. Perhaps we should uh, sit down some other time as well and discuss the more important stuff in the universe, like music and rock music. <laughs> of course, and, and espresso. <laughs> yes, you know, exactly. Things like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But thank you so much for uh, sitting down with us, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful. Yeah, my pleasure. Really enjoy speaking with you. So that was my conversation with my dear brother, Brian. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. To hear more such conversations, please subscribe to this channel, and also you can find us on Spotify on the KanaCast channel. That is K-A-N-H-A-C-A-S-T. Thank you for listening. This is Hilldog signing off. Namaste and woof woof. <laughs>